everybody today's topic or the topic we're going to discuss now is pulpectomy i will be talking about all the things related uh, or whatever a final year undergraduate should know and what and all is expected in an answer when asked about pulpectomy okay so the main thing moving on is the definition so now we have two definitions over here which are easy so you need to learn both of them this is important in respect to a uh, theory as well as practicals okay so according to mathewson pulpectomy involves complete removal of necrotic pulpal tissue from the root canals and coronal portion of d vital primary teeth to maintain the tooth in the dental arch now according to finn pulpectomy is a removal of all pulpal tissue from the coronal and radicular portions of the tooth. Finn's definition is much easier to remember, so I would suggest you learn Finn. And for extra marks or anything like that, you can just learn Mathewson's definition also. Now moving on to why the pulpectomy is done, like the rationale behind it is, it is to remove the irreversibly inflamed nitrotic radicular pulp tissue and gently clean the root system. It is also done to obturate the root canals with a filling material that will re-resorb at the same time as the primary tooth and be eliminated rapidly if extruded through the apex. Now what are we trying to achieve by doing a pulpectomy in a primary tooth? We are trying to achieve that the infectious process should resolve, resolve both clinically and radiographically following treatment. There should be a radiographic evidence of a successful filling without any gross overextension or underfilling. The treatment should permit resorption of primary root structures and filling materials at the appropriate time and permit normal eruption of the succedaneous tooth. There should be no radiographic evidence of further breakdown of the supporting tissues and the treatment should elevate and prevent further sensitivity, pain or swelling. There should be no evidence of internal resorption or pathological changes so moving on to the indications like not every primary tooth which has been affected by caries and require uh, can be saved by doing a pulpectomy so what are the indications basically primary tooth with pulpal information which are extending beyond the coronal pulp if it is limited to the coronal pulp a pulpotomy will suffice but if it's extending to the roots then a pulpectomy has to be done now primary teeth with carious pulp exposure in which following which the following the coronal pulp palpitation the radicular pulp shows signs of hyperemia where the bleeding is not stopping right that suggests that the radicular pulp is also infected primary teeth with necrotic pulse minimum root resorption and minimum bone de destruction in the bifurc bifurcation area non vital primary teeth with a sinus tract or abscess Pulpous primary teeth without permanent successors. Now, in such cases, you want to keep the primary tooth in the oral cavity as long as possible because there is no permanent successor to replace it even if it falls off. So, you want to like prevent its, uh, you know, uh, you know, prevent its loss as much as possible. Now, pulpless primary second molars before the eruption of permanent first molar. Now, like I had said in the previous space maintainers thing, like until the prime permanent first molar erupts, you have, you know, you have to try saving the second molars, primary second molars as much as possible. Because then the repercussions or the problems that arise if we lose a pulpless primary, uh, you know, if you lose a primary second molar are much more. A child patient having cellulitis due to infected primary tooth, a pulpless primary tooth in hemophiliacs, Pulpless anterior teeth with speech crowded arches when the speech or the crowded arches or aesthetics are a factor. So if you lose the anterior teeth, it affects the speech. Uh, then the space loss which can occur because you have lost a primary anterior tooth and also the aesthetics. Uh, pulpless primary teeth next to the line of a palatal cleft. Pulpless primary molars supporting orthodontic appliances. You want them to be a strong abutment if an orthodontic appliance is to be given using these molars or primary teeth as support. So, you know, sometimes if they are decay, 
rather do a pulpectomy if in case it's such as a pulpectomy has to be done and give a stainless steel crown and then an orthodontic appliance can be done on top of this a pulpless primary teeth when arch length is deficient a pulpless primary teeth when space maintainers or continued supervision are not feasible in all these the key word is pulpless so there's already no pulp you want to save these teeth but for different reasons now there's some contraindications such as when there's a non-restorable crown so you can't just do a pulpectomy and leave it you need to give a filling or you know you need to restore it with a crown stainless steel or a zirconia crowns but if there's no crown structure and a crown can't be given then there's no point in doing a pulpectomy periradicular involvement extending to the permanent tooth bud so there is already extensive infection which is already affecting the permanent tooth bud so there is it's not feasible to do a pulpectomy and to remove all the infection so it's rather you remove the tooth when this patch pathological resorption of at least one third of the root with the fistula strike now basically what happens is when there's an infection there's faster resorption of the root so when you see that the root has resorbed you know uh, where at least one third of the root is gone then you need to start thinking of alternatives when there's excessive internal resorption so again um, a good pulpectomy will not be you know can't be done because there's internal resorption it means there is again infection which is leading to the resorption internally extensive extensive pulpal floor opening into the burr bifurcation presence of a dentigerous or a follicular cyst is also a contraindication moving on till there are certain medical contraindications too a child with a heart defect or any history of heart disease heart surgery rheumatic fever etc again a pulpectomy can be a source of endocarditis so you would rather you know treat or you remove the tooth than let it be a source of an infection immunocompromised children such as malignant disease like leukemia neutropenic for you know considerable periods of time systemic illnesses like hepatitis or children on long term corticosteroid therapy are all con medical contraindications now there are certain inherent difficulties like a you know a molar tooth they the root structure you know they have it's curved to include the permanent tooth bud in between the roots so it's a very curved root structure so a very good cleaning and shaping is a very difficult uh, to achieve very good results with a root a curve like this now they also these have a lot of collateral canals so you know leaving behind any kind of tissue or anything is highly possible so you need to be really good at this a phys physiological root resorption the root resorption starts early so you what you think is the apex may not be the apex like in this case where i thought it could extend and then there was lateral resorption that had happened and the material extruded there's also possibility of damage to the permanent successor when you get overzealous and you know extrude the files while doing the cleaning and shaping so you can or you can tend to damage the permanent successor tooth bud moving on there are two types of pulpectomy there's a partial and there's a total or a complete pulpectomy in total pulpectomy it is the extirpation of the pulp almost near the foramen where the root apex is fully formed and the foramen is sufficiently close to permit the obturation with conventional filling materials okay while in partial it is done when the root is not completely developed or there's an open apex so you leave behind some amount of vital tissue to induce root formation okay moving on the other types two types of pulpectomy that's a single visit or a multiple visit while in single visit it is applicable to vital teeth when hemorrhage from the amputated amputated radicular pulp stem is uncontrolled so indications include a large carious exposure with frank involvement of radicular tissue while the contraindications are when there are periapical changes multi visit pulpectomies include when there are 
if there's an infection, there's an abscess or a chronic sinus exist when there's non-vital primary teeth or there are teeth with necrotic pulp and periapical involvement. All of these suggest there's a lot of infection that is present and a single sitting will not be helpful because you know you give the tooth some time to recover from this. So what we do in such kind of case especially when there's an abscess or, or like the cellulitis or something, you open up the tooth you do not clean or anything you just make do an access opening and just leave it okay call the patient back another visit where the cleaning and shaping is done by then you know there is this reduce a uh, reduction in the infection then you place a medicament in the canal so that the tooth heals by healing I meant that the infection reduces and then in the third visit you can do an obturation and finish the pulpectomy. There are certain steps in pulpectomy. First of all, you take a pre-operative radiograph to confirm the depth of the lesion, the length of the root, if there's any resorption, if there's any internal resorption. So you take a pre-operative radiograph. Then once it's confirmed, yes, a pulpectomy has to be done, you move on, you give local anesthesia. You apply rubber dam. Rubber dam can be avoided when there's cases of abscess or the cellulitis. The patient is already has a swelling, it's in pain. You can let go of the rubber dam. Then you remove the carious dentine or if there's any faulty restoration below which there were secondary caries that had happened. Then you do an access opening. Okay. Recognize all the canals. Then you determine the working length. The determination of working length can be done you you know you can do it radiographically or non-radiographically I'll be telling about it later. Removal of pulp tissue okay you can use an hedge file remove the pulp tissue or you can use a brooch also to remove the pulp tissue. You debride the canal right then moving on you do the chemomechanical preparation irrigation or and drying of the canals and once you're satisfied you do an obturation followed by a final restoration. Moving on, access opening for pulpectomy of primary teeth. Now, this is one of the most important phases of root canal because this is where you, you know, you see or you recognize all the canals that are present. Sometimes they have three, sometimes there will be four. So you need to locate all the canals. Now, the objective says obtaining a straight line axis, right? So you get a straight line axis you remove all the carious part of the tooth you do not leave behind anything conservation of tooth structure as much as possible and you de-roof the chamber followed that's the pulpal chamber followed by exposure and removal of pulpal horns now moving on you determine the working length like i said you do it either radiographically or non-radiographically radiographically there's conventional methods are the ingle or the grossman method you either do a digital radiography, zero radiography, radio visiography, or a tomography. Non radiographically, you can use a tactile sense where you, you know, you use the sense where you put the files and you can feel it when you reach the apex, right? So you then you determine it that okay, so this and you place the stopper and then you can use it on a scale or an end block and then determine the working length or a paper point. You place the paper point, you see how deep it's going, you remove it, it would have, it will be wet, so you can make out how much, how deep it's gone and you can then measure the length. Apical PDL sensitivity or even apex locators. Here I'm just describing one method, I think that's more than enough, that is the Ingalls method. You must have learned about it in endo, so where you measure the tooth in the preoperative radiograph. You subtract at least 1 mm for safety allowance. Then you place the instrument, place the stopper and which you, whichever point you're using as a reference point. Then you develop a radiograph. You take a radiograph and then on the radiograph you measure the difference between the end of the instrument and the apex. Now if you feel you've extruded or gone beyond the apex, then you reduce the length. But if you feel if you're short of the apex, if you're not yet reach the apex, then you add it to the length that was determined before on the preoperative data.
moving on you have the chemical sorry chemo mechanical preparation so in this more commonly we use the h files because in h files you the cleaning happens or the shaping happens when you remove the instrument mostly canals are enlarged up to a size of 35 or 40 this is normally done in primary molars while in anteriors the canals are already wide enough then cleaning and shaping is of is as cleaning the canals is as important as shaping now usually very commonly seen in primary teeth are zipping and perforation already there's very less tooth structure there's very less the thickness of the dentine that's present is less so you need to be very careful you do not perforate the tooth and certain uh, irrigants which are used sometimes it's a uh, one percent sodium hypochlorite or even chlorexidine it's that is the choice we can use or even normally saline can also be used to wash out the fragments of pulpal tissue and because with sodium hypochlorite you have to be very careful especially in children you need to take all kinds of precautions so that but if you're using a rubber dam that's nothing like it you can use sodium hypochlorite moving on what are the ideal properties that we're looking at when we are when we try to choose an irrigating solution its compatibility in terms of physical and chemical properties it should have an antibacterial capacity with chelating actions and should help in dis tissue dissolve, dissolution moving on to intracanal medicaments so sometimes when we have a tooth which is ridden with a lot of infection we do especially in the multiple visit pulpectomies we do place intracanal medicaments such medicaments are used to eliminate any remaining bacteria after the canal instrumentation and cleaning it's also ready, you know helps in the reduction in the inflammation of the periapical tissue and pulpal remnants renders the canal content, contents inert and neutralizes any tissue debris it acts as a barrier against leakage from the any temporary filling and helps to dry persistently wet canals so when you mean persistently wet canals is when you have a weeping canal which is where you have continuous uh, you know, pus or any kind of infection uh, thing when you it keeps on coming in how much ever you do there's just it, you cannot dry it. so the, it's called a wet or a weeping canal commonly used medicament is calcium hydroxide moving on to obturation now the aim of obturation is to prevent the recontamination of the canal system from either apical or a coronal leakage and to isolate and neutralize any remaining pulpal tissue or bacteria in the canals now ideal filling technique should assure that there's complete filling of the canals without any overfill or with minimal or no voids now there are certain criteria when you try to choose an ideal pulpectomy material so it should be it should be a, a resorbable material you cannot use gutta percha because the gutta percha doesn't resorb so in a primary tooth the material that we're using needs to resorb ideally at the same rate as which the tooth resorbs so that along with the tooth the material also resorbs and it's lost along with the tooth then this it should have an antiseptic property it should be non-inflammatory and non-irritating to the underlying permanent tooth germ it should be radio opaque so that when you take a radiograph you should at least you can visualize how much of the material is filled and if in case you need to redo it it should be easy to remove and as well easy to insert into the canals moving on there are many different types of materials that are present you all ideally should know what are the different types of materials and their contents now most commonly which we use was zinc oxide eugenol taste now, it was discovered by Bonacci in 1837 and first used in dentistry by Chris Homan in 1876 now moving on to the composition there are two types now this sorry they're not of two types it comes in the form of powder and liquid now the powder contains of zinc oxide zinc stearate zinc acetate and rosin while the liquid contains of eugenol oils of cloves vegetable or mineral oil acetic acid and water easy to remember 
while the powder has a zinc oxide part, the liquid has a huge non-part. What are the advantages with this material is that it's radio-opaque, it has good plasticity, it's cost-effective, also less cytotoxic to cells in direct or indirect contact. Also, it's an effective antimicrobial agent. While the disadvantages include, it's a, sometimes underfilling is possible. There is foreign body reaction when overfilled, like when you extrude zinc oxide, John, foreign body reaction can occur. And the resorption rate is slow. That means if it's extruded, it tends to remain in the tissue, underlying tissue, and can cause, sometimes it causes a deflection of the permanent tube part because the permanent tube part wants to extrude, but there's, you know, there's maybe a small part of zinc oxide eugen all over there, and then the permanent tube part gets dislodged. Moving on to calcium hydroxide. Now, this is now being, you know, very rarely used as a filling or as an obturate material, more of an intracanal medicament. So you just need to know that calcium hydroxide is one of the materials that was being used. It was introduced by Herman in 1930. Now there are different types of iodoform paste, mostly the Wolkhoff, KRI paste and the Mesto paste. Now the Wolkhoff paste has consists of sterilized iodoform paste as a vehicle for a carefully blended mixture of parachlorophenol, camphor, menthol, for root canal therapy in primary teeth. Now the parachlorophoma is 33 to 37%. It acts as a disinfectant action depending on the liberation of chlorine in the presence of phenol. This liberation of chlorine is what is acting as the antimicrobial for us. Then there's camphor and menthol in Volkoff paste. Moving on KRI paste. Now the composition includes iodoform, camphor, parachlorophenol and menthol. Advantages being it has a disinfectant property again because of the parachlorophenol. Due to its smooth viscous nature it can be spun in with a lenticular spiral and injected with a pressure steroid. It is also resorbable and resorbs in synchrony with the root. Now this is one of the very acceptable properties of this is because it resorbs along with and the same rate as the Two. Mesto paste. Now it was developed by Mesto in 1967. Composition includes zinc oxide, iodoform, thymol, chlorophenol, camphor, and linolin. Now zinc oxide, thymol, and linolin is the additional thing to the contents of KRI paste. Okay, so KRI paste had iodoform, chlorophenol, and camphor. Now they added zinc oxide, thymol and lenolin to make it a mesto paste. These iodoform paste, they resorb rapidly. Basically mesto paste has, resorbs rapidly and it has no undesirable effect on the succedinous tea. It has a long lasting bactericidal potential. If extruded periapically, it will be replaced with normal tissues. There is no foreign body reaction seen here. Huh? doesn't set into a hard mass so if in case of any you know any time where you have to redo it then this it can easily be removed excellent healing properties and provides radio obesity but one of the downfalls of this is rate of resorption of material within the canals is faster than the rate of the physiological root resorption moving on there's white apex Again, a very popular root canal filling material for primary teeth. Composition includes iodoform, calcium hydroxide and silicone. Remember the percentages if you can. Iodoform is 40.4%, calcium hydroxide 30.3%, while silicone is 22.4%. It comes as a premix paste and is enclosed in a syringe with a nozzle. Advantages, it is easy to apply. It resorbs at a slightly faster rate than the roots. No toxic, toxic effects on permanent successor. Even if we extrude this filling, nothing happens to the permanent teeth. And also it is radio-opaque. A newer material is endoflas. Again, powder in liquid form. Powder has triiodomethene, anidine, dibutylol, 
ortho chrysol zinc oxide calcium hydroxide and barium sulfate while liquid contains eugenol and parachlorophenol guides pinto paste again it has three materials a rifocot three medicines basically rifocot has pred which is prednisolone acetate 5 mg which acts as an anti inflammatory and antibiotic camphor camphorated pmcc that is paramonochlorophen 30% of pmcc 70% of camphor both of which act as antimicrobial analgesics then you have iodoform which is basically iodine which acts as the antimicrobial moving on there is triple antibiotic paste also so basically this is what is this lstr it is lesion sterilization tissue reaction due to polymicrobial nature of the infected root canal combination of antibacterial drug is required now there are three drugs which are used again metronidazole because of its wide bactericidal spectrum against anaerobic bacteria ciprofloxacin which is again a broad spectrum antibiotic against aerobic gram negative organisms minocycline which is a long acting antibiotic given against both gram negative and gram positive organisms and a liquid to carry the three mix into the entire dentin and through the dental tubules to kill all the bacteria in the lesions it basically uses this to basically sterile the entire lesion so you excavate place this and the entire lesion becomes sterile that means all the bacteria are killed because these all the three antibiotics act on a wide range acts on both anaerobic and aerobic as well as gram positive as well as gram negative bacteria moving on to obturation techniques now you know what is to be done now how are you going to do it you know of the different types of obturating materials how are you going to place it into the canal now we have different types you can use a lenterospiral technique or a endodontic pressure syringe incremental filling technique you can obturate using a wet cotton you can use premix syringes like in the case of vitapex mechanical or a tubercular syringe technique a jiffy tube method or even a amalgam plug up now the thin mix of and reinforced zinc oxide eugenol basically is prepared and paper points or k files are covered with a material which are used to coat the root canal first to make a thin mix coat the root canal and then a thick mix of zinc oxide eugenol is done it's prepared rolled into a point and carried into a the canal how now carrying the thick mix of zinc oxide you know you can use a lenterous spiral basically it's you know you can use the lenterous spiral in the manual method or in a rotating okay using a contrainkle hand piece okay uh, so a lenterous spiral or a vimo or a file is held by hand zinc oxide paste is carried by dipping the spiral into the mix inserted into the canal with clockwise rotation accompanied by vibratory motion to reach the apex and then you withdraw from the canal while simultaneously continuing the rotate clockwise rotating motion process is repeated 5 to 7 times until you feel that the canal is filled moving on endodontic pressure syringe this is an endodontic pressure syringe it consists of an internally threaded barrel with a threaded hub a threaded plunger threaded needle and a small bench using this syringe a very thick mix of zinc oxide you know can be forced through an extremely narrow gauge needle one of the disadvantages are that it has relatively complex and the need to disable it to load additional filling material the entire syringe has to be disabled just to load additional if you feel you're falling short of the material and also there's a need for immediate cleaning to prevent hardening of the filling material because zinc oxide sets into a hard mass moving on to an incremental filling technique okay so in this method an endodontic plug corresponding to the size of the canal with a rubber stopper is used to place a thick mix of zinc oxide into the canal the length of the plug should at least be 2 mm short of the root canal length okay whatever is your working length choose 2 mm short take a thick mix place it into the canal 
a thick mix of zinc oxide is prepared rolled into a flame shape okay then again measuring that it's almost 2 mm short of the uh, length of the working length you make that zinc oxide unit and start starting from the tapered part of the rolled mix it is carried into the canal and tap, tapped gently into the apical area then again additional increments of 2 mm blocks are added until the canal is filled so you start so in this technique basically let's summarize it you know what is the working length take 2 mm short take the plugger take around 2 mm of the thick mix place it into the canal so that is almost nearing the apex then you tap it gently make sure it's packed then next take another 2 mm put it into the canal again push it where you had previously stopped continue doing this until you feel that the canal is filled Tuberculin or a local anesthetic syringe can also be used. These are again disposable. Uh, this one again used to pay, uh, place the zinc oxide fusion oil paste. Now using wet cotton. In this method, you first zinc oxide is mixed, taken into the root canal using a file or reamer. Okay, so you pack the canal with that. Then you use a small wet cotton pellet and you can use it to condense the material inside the canal. You need to repeat it at least 5 to 18 but in this you do not have control and it can lead to extrusion of the material because sometimes if you put extra force while using the cotton pellet you are going to extrude the material jiffy tube method again a regular mix of zinc oxide is back loaded into this tube and then this part of the tube is placed into the canal orifice and the metal is expressed into the canal by downward squeezing motion until you feel that material coming out of the orifice of the canal. Amalgam pluggers, you've used amalgam pluggers to do an amalgam restoration. You can use this in the same way, use it to carry the zinc oxide into the canal. Premix syringes like Metapex and Vitapex are also used. It's nothing you clean, dry the canals, place the tip into the canal as far as possible and then slowly withdrawing the syringe, you start pressing the thing. So you feel the material filling into the canals. One of the disadvantages is due to the thickness and limited flexibility of the plastic needle. This is made of plastic. The tip of the Metapex syringe is made of plastic and it's not very flexible. It, you may not be able to reach the apex okay and it's easy to use for primary incisors because the canals are much wider in the incisors but not very practical for especially narrow canals of primary molar especially the first primary molars they're very narrow canals moving on now you've finished an observation that's not the end you need to do a final restoration ideally it is to be done using a stainless steel crown also can be done using a composite restoration, glass inomer restoration, open face crown, right? Even a miracle mix restoration can be done. This is to prevent any kind of infection or any kind of, you know, outside kind of any uh, infection reaching the canals again. Because you've cleaned it, you've shaped it, made sure you've, you know, you've removed all the infection. But if you do not do a proper restoration post pulpectomy, then its chances of failure is high okay now how would you define like what is a success you know if a pulpectomy is successful or not if there is no pathological mobility post pulpectomy there's no sensitivity to percussion or you know this healthy appearance of the soft tissue surrounding the teeth you know it is a success radiographically there is no evidence of bone or root resorption except for that associated with the exfoliation process. Bifurcation radiolucency, if any was present before pulpectomy, has resolved 6 to 12 months post-operatively. No periapical radiolucency post-operative. Now, sometimes pulpectomy fails, right? And what are the signs and symptoms? There's pain, there's swelling, alveolar abscess, there's over-retention of the treated primary tooth. A deflection of the erupting succedaneous tooth you know if you have extruded the material there are succedaneous tooth defects enamel defects in the permanent tooth if you see them that means the pulpectomy done before had failed 
over obturation or an under obturation both of which are again a failure or if there's a periapic collapses post treating then again it can be a failure now to summarize the entire ppt or the entire topic what was our goal our goal was to completely remove necrotic pulpal tissue from the root canals and the coronal portion of the prior devital primary tooth to maintain a tooth in the dental arch how we planning we were going to do it do the access cavity preparation have straight line access to all the canals remove all the carious tissue care you know do a coronal pulp palpitation locate the canals pulp extirpation from the canals determine the working length debride the canals do a chemi chemo mechanical preparation of the canal use a proper irrigant whatever you are using if it's even a saline chlorex and even sodium hypochlorite make sure it's properly used dry the root canals before you obturate always dry the root canals then do an obturation followed by a final restoration the different types of obturating materials we could use is zinc oxide dilution or calcium hydroxide or even the iodoform paste thank you